Hey, this is Matt once again. What about you in the video? This is a paid request, this time for Nate. Thank you so much for that, Nate. And for those interested in requesting pretty much any type of videos, uh, topics, reactions, commentaries, reviews, re-reviews, what have you, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both things are down below in the info box under pretty much each of these videos. Sorry about that. <coughs> I don't know why, whenever I do reviews, I always get easily <laughs> dry in my throat, so I apologize for the drinking of the water, because <clears throat> then that happens. But he wanted me to talk about the 2003 film, Willard, which I do have the DVD. Now, funny enough, well, it's not funny, because <laughs> it's not funny to the people who made the film. I am one of those few people that saw this film in the theaters when it came out in 2003. Yes. In 2003 this came out and I remember I was in San Marcos, Texas. And when I was there I was very close to the movie theater. So close I could walk there. And in 2003, I mentioned this before, that's the year that after I probably went to the theater at least once a week. Maybe once in a while I would skip a week, but pretty much every week I would go to the theater and watch a movie. And like play some video games like Time Crisis or something and get some popcorn and go see it. And I saw Bad Boys 2 twice. I saw I think, Terminator 3, Matrix Reloaded, Matrix Revolutions, Kangaroo Jack, this movie, uh, and so on and so forth. A lot of 2003 movies. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen was around that time. I saw that in the theater. Hulk. I saw that in the theater. And like I said, this was one. And I remember I went in and went, Huh, what do you Willard? Says a lot of times I would go there and go like, What movie is playing? And you know, Let me check this movie out. Because you know, the theater experience. I swear the first week, maybe it was the second week, could have been, you know how a movie theater, if a movie's ready to get kicked out, it'll be at the end and the smaller screen? It was already near the end. And I went, well, fuck, that's weird. Like, they already kicked this movie out and it just came out. I think by the week after it was out. So, this, not all, but for a lot of theaters, this did not last long. And it's a shame, because it's not that bad of a movie. Now, there's the original Willard. And, the original Willard is okay of a movie. Um, I always forget the, the guy's name. He played the senator in the first Etchman movie. Bruce Davison? Uh, I always forget his name. So sorry if I got that wrong. But he was he played senator... If you remember the first Etchman movie, he was the senator that was taken and then chained. Anyway. He's been a lot of other stuff, too. This one it stars Crispin Glover. And Crispin Glover, you remember, as the dad... But fly and Back to the Future. He was a villain character in the 2000 Charlie's Angels, those movies. And he kind of been labeled as this kind of weirdo way he acts. And to be honest, I mean, he's done it himself. He, the way he asks in certain things in interviews, but when you see interviews with him, he does, he seems like a decent enough guy. And I, people may also remember him doing the funky weird dancing in Friday the 13th part 4 the final chapter but I thought this was a great performance by him and if nothing else the movie's worth seeing for him and it's kind of a shame this film came and went because I think it would have been nice to see him garner more big roles because of this performance he did a really good job Arlie Ermey plays the boss, who Ernest Borgnine played in the original Willard. And it's directed by Glenn Morgan. Now, for those who don't know, Glenn Morgan 
with his buddy James Wan, which they were both producers on this, but Glenn Morgan wrote and directed it. They worked a lot on the X-Files. Quite a few X-Files episodes, especially the early seasons, they were either you know, write or direct. And they also took over some shows, like Season 2 of Millennium with Lance Hemerson. They were the main fo guys behind that. Which kind of... I, it kind of screwed up the show because they made it more supernatural, which I prefer the more serial killer Season 1 Millennium. They created that show, what was it, Space Above and Beyond... James Wan would go direct the first Final Destination movie. And then I believe he also directed The One with Jet Li. So now it's time for Glenn Morgan to direct. And he did this. And I thought that he did a really good job making a film where, from the opening titles, with horror movies at that time, there was either torture porn, the Hostel, Saw films... I should try to think. Saw films. Maybe that was 2004. So maybe that hadn't been a thing yet. I'm trying to remember when Hostel. Hostel was 2005. So maybe that wasn't even yet. It, it was. It was going on that way for those movies to arrive. I mean, 2003. You had Frey vs. Jason. That came out the same year. And I'm trying to remember what other horror films came out in 2003. This was not a jump steer movie. It was not a gory movie at all. Um, it wasn't, quote, scary, it was just more uh, maybe creepy, but it was an interesting film because of the camel work, the performances, especially Crispin Glover. Maybe because it wasn't gory and jump steer and all sorts of things, maybe that's one of the reasons why it led to flopping. Also, maybe because, like, Crispin Glover... Is that a name to carry a film? I'm sure a lot of people still didn't know who the hell Crispin Glover was. Okay, the dad from Back to the Future, alright. Probably people thought this should this was a film that should have been in direct video but it had a decent enough budget where it's a good looking movie. Like the opening credits, it's very creative. Like a stop motion rabbit still uh, rabbit. Mouse rat skeleton coming up, and these weird ice house on haunted hill seven, like those creative opening tiles that people would do back then. This had another creative one, and the director had a lot of sweeping cameras to really give a feel of like an old fashioned movie to this. It didn't feel MTV style editing, which is a very common thing to do at the time. This went against that. And Crispin Glover's character Willard, he's a guy who ultimately I did feel sorry for. His father died from suicide. His mom is verbally abusive but sick and he's trying to help her out. He lives a very, very lonely existence. Very lonely. His boss, Arlie Ermey, you know, from Full Metal Jacket, may he rest in peace, he's just, like Arlie Ermey can do, verbally abusive to Crispin. He's not respected at work. There's this lady, Laura, is that her? Laura Lena Herring? I'm thankful they didn't try to do too much of a love story. It just seemed like she's a co-worker that is one of the only to be kind of you know nice to him. But yeah, I, it was refreshing to not try to force a love story into it. Because it just wouldn't hold water. It wouldn't hold water, so to speak. And I was just put down. I mean, Arlie Yermi saying stuff like, Yo, I didn't show up in one of my dad, dead dad's cheap suits. You know, it's a slow build movie, and he's again very picked on. And you know, there's these rats around the the place, the the house, and he sets up traps, and one is trapped, and he helps it out, and it's this rat here, this mouse, which he names Socrates and treats very well, 
and then starts feeding the other mice and rats and they start listening to him and you even have this big one as he names Big Ben and then this realization the belly uses these rats to help him out so whether to get to Arlie Ermey's fancy car and have them bite the shit out of the tires I do think they do a decent enough job making him still you feel sorry for although he is doing bad things on the flip side hmm. Uh, okay, I'm going to spoilers, starting out spoilers. If you've seen the original, you pretty much know what's going to happen. He's ultimately going to get to a point where he's going to get the rats and go to his boss and go tear them up, which he does. Now, I do think a lot of this film, the way the rats are handled are pretty efficient with the way they train the rats and they go from here to here. There are there are occasions where they use CGI rats. Like there's a bit where the elevator opens and they all cascade down. It's an interesting idea for a shot. It just when you watch it today, I mean that was 2003. It's 2022. So damn, that's I didn't realize that's fucking almost 20 years later. Fuck. That is almost 20 years later. Jesus. That's fucking crazy. But. It just. You know, it doesn't hold up the best. It's pretty noticeable. But at least they do use a good chunk of. Actual mice and rats. It's not all CG like they would do nowadays. And when I say that they still, you still feel a bit sorry that there's a bit where this dog keeps, this little dog keeps biting him, biting him, biting him. And then, oh yeah, you want to know what's in the bag? He puts the dog in there and he's like smiling and then he hears the dog whine. And the re the fact they put a reaction on his face and then he gets the dog out. I like that he doesn't just ultimately, boom, now he's 100% psycho. It's, he has guilt, he feels sorry, the dog runs off. Scared, but you're not immediately eaten alive or something. But it's not until a bit later on when uh, you know he's doing things that you're not supposed to do, no matter what's going on in your life. Now, I thought they did a decent enough job trying to get the friendship between him and Socrates. Like there's a bit where he's down to his last legs and he's ready to kill himself, but Socrates like stops the knife. And in a weird way it made it a bit heartwarming that you really bought him being so friendly with this, you know, mouse, rat, however you want to put it. Yeah, you know, this white rat just being friendly. And with with Ben, at least they do try to put a little bit of. It seems like Ben just wants attention from Crispin Glover. Just it's like okay, they introduce Big Ben, and then he sees him. Then the next thing you can't go, you're too big. Then all of a sudden he's the leader now. I thought that was a bit too quick. I thought that like, maybe there were other moments where Bib Ben was trying to do stuff for Willard and Willard was impressed and then made him the leader. I thought maybe a bit more scenes with Ben. And you do have like scenes where Ben wants to be in bed just like Socrates is and then Crispin tries to hurt him. 
But it's one of those things I don't think they did. I think they could have done a better job showcasing why Chris Ben is so hateful against Ben. I, it just seemed a bit from zero to hundred where you're on my bed. Now, I'm going to fucking kill you with how much he's loving all these other rats and stuff. I just thought it was a bit, like I said, a bit like zero to a hundred. I, I think maybe a few more scenes where he's trying to be nice to Ben, but then Ben just won't let it go. And <clears throat> I don't know. I, I just maybe a bit more explanation as to why he hates Ben so much. Because it's never really said. There's a bit where the co-worker tries, after he gets fired and all this stuff's happening. And, well actually by then, like his mom died. And you're not, I guess you'd assume that maybe Ben killed her? Or Ben maybe, just, she's on the stairs face down dead. And, I don't know, we're may, maybe we're made to assume that Ben killed her? Or did she just have a heart attack? I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure on that. Maybe it's more clear to others. Um, then you have this... You have this bit where the co-worker has a cat, and Chris Ben could have just said, no, I, I don't want to... I'm allergic to cats. Could have just said that or something. But no, he takes the cat, puts it in there, and then the cat... Being a cat lover... It's a horror film, I get it. And, you know, it's... Is that like something really happened to the cat, unlike other movies? Michael ja the Jackson 5 saw Ben. Just for those who don't remember, Willard, the original, had a sequel called Ben. And that's the movie where the Jackson 5 saw Ben was made for. That's in this. While the cat's running around and also he gets, falls and dies, is killed, eaten up by the rats. And, I mean, as a cat lover, that was a bit of a turn off. But it didn't ruin the movie or anything. It was like, eh. But I, I did it, why they did it. Especially with how the movie was originally supposed to end. It was supposed to mirror... The way the cat falls is engulfed by, engulfed by the rats. It's supposed to, to jump ahead when Crispin Glover falls. He, it's like the same type of shot, and then the rats cover him. So you go, okay, it killed the cat. Now this is how it's supposed to kill Crispin Glover. Just to jump ahead, the original ending, which is all in here, is he dies at the end. And I like the ending they have in a theatrical cut, but at the same time, I get that the way it ends originally, I guarantee you the studio had a say in, no, you have to have him live, it's, or at least in an asylum. I'm sure that was a reshoot. Just by the end, he's so far gone, his mom is dead. His house is gone. He's losing everything. He gets fired. Sorry about that. Uh, Arlie Ermy, spoiler alert. Arlie Ermy, well, I already did spoil it. He kills Socrates. And he's so far gone. Gets with Ben. They go and kill Arlie Ermy. He betrays the rats, and then decides to... Again, maybe that was another thing, is that he so... I, I guess that's the thing, he wasn't really liking the rats, he liked Socrates, who was with the rats. And now that he's gone, he doesn't give a shit about the other rats. But again, maybe a bit more of him, maybe trying to connect with the other rats, and it's not the same. Trying to connect with Ben, and it's not the same. And that's where it gets into his mentality of it wasn't the rats, it was Socrates, it was his friend. Maybe, I don't know, just a bit more in between of that build up. But he gets the elevator by Ben, goes home, chased around, and then in the original ending, he died. But in the theatrical, in this, he goes up, kills Ben, 
and then he's in asylum. And then a rat comes in. I don't know if that rat's supposed to be in his mind. And he's imagining it, or it's just another happens to be another white rat, and he thinks it's his friend reincarnated. And it's like maybe setting himself up for a sequel. Like it'll you know there'll be a time where I'll get out or or make his escape. I didn't maybe try to set up sir uh, you know a sequel. I don't know. The idea why people would think that the original ending, like he. Him dying, I, I did why people say that would be more fitting. <clears throat> as much as Arlie Ermey was a piece of shit, it is, you know, can't do that, it's too far. But at the same time, they didn't make him such an irredeemable character in the fact of, like, he wasn't hurting the lady, he didn't, you know, hurt that daughter, he didn't. He could have just said no to the cat instead of throwing the cat in there. I didn't feel like he had any regret for that either. But at the same time, Ben wasn't really in the wrong. I mean, Ben is kind of like Willard. Like, the way Willard was treating Ben was how everyone was treating Willard. So Ben and Willard were kind of the same. And maybe that's the point, is that Socrates was the middleman that could call them both. But Ben and Willard, I mean, yeah, Ben and Willard were the same. Where, again, the way people treated Willard is how Willard treated Ben for seemingly no reason. So really, Ben seemed, that's why I say, I don't know if he meant to kill the, the old lady or if the old lady died. And then Ben was following orders. So it seems like Ben is more of the one to root for than Willard, if that's the case. Which is probably why the original ending was Ben would be the one standing tall through the window. Again, I'm sure because the studio, nope, we gotta kill him. Because obviously Ben didn't die in the original, that's why they got a sequel called Ben, who like helped this kid and guess you call him a good guy in that. Now, if you don't like rats, this could creep you out. Let's say the camel work, the way it goes around the the house, the mansion, it's not using quick cuts and editing of that type that was known in, during this time period. Uh, I thought it was a very efficient direction. I thought the acting, especially Crispin Glover, I thought he knocked out of the park there's some really good scenes of emotions where he's not overdoing it, but the same you see the tears coming down. Like he was really committed to the part. And him alone is worth a watch for this movie. Like I said, other than some CGI rats that eh, don't hold the best, a lot of the rats, the way they were trained, the way they were utilized, fairly well done. Like I said, the way that made me actually care about this guy here, I thought was commendable. Oh, based on the book, The Rat Man's Notebooks, by Stephen Gilbert. Didn't I realize that? Yeah, I thought it was, when I saw in the theater, I thought it was a pretty decent movie, and that's why I picked up on DVD. And if you're wondering on the DVD, 12 deleted alternate scenes, which I should have checked those out. I just checked the alternate ending. Commentary with... Glenn Morgan, James Wan, Crispin Glover, Arlie Ermey, Dr. Mirror and the Matthew Willard. Yeah, there's a music video on Ben because Crispin Glover actually sings a version of the song at the end credits. Trailer, TV spots. Glenn Morgan, I know he only did one other film, and that was Black Christmas, the 2006 film. And you know what? I don't hate that movie like others do. It's not a great movie. It has its issues, but... I thought it st had enough style and crazy gore. I thought the act... The character could have been better written, to be fair. But I thought the acting was competent enough. It was. I thought it was a, kind of a fun B-movie, gory, crazy flick. But it has its problems and its issues. Don't get me wrong. But fuck, compared to that other Black Christmas, the one from a few years ago, tell us this Black Christmas looks like Halloween. 
But it's interesting if you... Actually, you don't even need the DVD. Look up Black Christmas 2006 Filmmaker's Diary, I think it's called. It's Glenn Morgan talking about very... And it's on the DVD as well. Very candidly about the failure of this movie. And how it really bummed him out. Like, this is a film he believed in. And it bummed him out, bummed him out so badly. He thought he would never direct again. And he directed Black Christmas 2006, not really because he wanted to, but because hoping to have a hit movie. And that he doesn't really like gore, he doesn't really like jump steers, which neither were in this. So he decided to make a film that he didn't really want to make, but hopefully to get a hit. And I hate to say it, he didn't do that, and he did it for the wrong reasons. Because at least there are people that respect this film, it might not have been a hit. Not really people respect to us this Black Christmas. Although, again, I don't hate it like other people do. I can watch it for what it is. I've seen a lot worse movies, believe me. But it's a very interesting uh, interview. Again, it's told... I forget, it's Filmmaker's... Not documentary, but... I forget, I forget what the hell it was called. Yeah, very interesting. But with that said, Willard 2003, I think it's a. Uh, got a great performance by Crispin Glover. And. Because of that, I'd probably say I liked it a bit more than the original. I will say. But I like the camera work, I like the direction, I like the, the feel, the atmosphere of the film. And, yeah, this is when New Line Cinema was a thing. I didn't I forgot about that. Yeah, New Line Cinema, when they were a thing, nowadays not so much, but they would actually do these Platinum series where they would actually put features on it. For some reason, never did it for Ninja Turtles or Mortal Kombat, but they seemingly did it for everything else. Go figure. But, hey, with that said, uh, worth a watch for the Halloween season. Thanks for watching. Take care. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.